and you all discover yet again another piece of evidence showing that Sardak the Sinister and not Petrova the Pure is behind the string of murders. Nice plot twist. I love how you can expect one thing to happen and then something totally different happens. Yeah, isn't D&D great? Now, let's find this Sardak character and do some stabby stabby. Oh yes, who would have guessed that Petrova the Pure was innocent and that it was actually Sardak the Sinister? Yeah, a fat cat would have thought it would have been vice versa, you know, uh, sort of irony and naming sort of thing. I agree. It's also good to play through a good murder mystery in D&D too. Hey, wait a second. Why aren't you wearing a mask? Yeah, you know the rules of the table. No mask, no D&D. Oh, whatever. I have a high constitution saving throw. It's only little wussies like the rogue and the wizard that gotta be worried. But that's exactly the point. You could be infected with the scourge of nations and pass it on to the rest of us. Well, then you all shouldn't have dumped constitution in favor of intelligence and dexterity. Actually, constitution is the second most important ability score in the game. Second to your class's primary ability score. And uh, smart players never dump constitution. Hey. Did the druid just call me stupid? Maybe, but he's got a point. Why did you dump constitution? Look, you guys, it is not for us to judge a person based upon which stats they decided to dump or not. All players should be treated equally. Agreed, but it is still troubling that even players who wear masks could still get the scourge of nations. Well, well, that's because we're all guys and we don't wash our hands after we go to the bathroom and then we touch each other's dice. Yeah, that, that's a good point. So, uh, maybe we should start washing our hands then? No, no, actually, this new book, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, has the solution on page 141. As part of developing a social contract for our group, we're supposed to consider hard and soft limits and a common out of game limit is dice sharing. Holy crap! You mean we have to stop touching each other's dice? I'd rather start washing my hands. Welcome to the DM Layer. I'm Luke Hart, and I've been a dungeon master since high school. On this channel, I give practical dungeon master advice that you can use in your Dungeons and Dragons games. Today in the Layer, I'll be going over my 10 steps for creating an event-based adventure. And in case you're wondering what the heck an event-based adventure is, let me contrast it with a location-based adventure. You see, a location-based adventure takes place in one specific place, such as a dungeon or a castle, and is by far the norm for published D&D adventure modules, and I'm guessing for homebrew campaigns too. However, an event-based adventure is not tied to any one place in the game world, such as a dungeon or a castle. Instead of being defined in part by where the adventure takes place, an event-based adventure is framed by the events that take place. Imagine that. It's called event-based adventure and it's framed by the events that take place. Specifically, an event-based adventure is framed by what the villain does and what the player's characters do in response to the villain's actions. And where those events take place is of secondary importance. And then these events and the character's responses to them all tie together to form the meat of the adventure, which will most assuredly take place in a variety of locations. The big advantage of running an event-based adventure is that because things are not confined to a dungeon or other location, your players will feel like they have much greater freedom with what they can do in the adventure. Another difference, which is either pro or a con, depending on your point of view, is that event-based adventures can require less preparation from the dungeon master before the game, but rely on far more improvisation during the game. Whereas with a location-based adventure, there is typically far more preparation before the game and much less improvisation during the game. These based on my experience. Which brings up an interesting point here because the Dungeon Master Guide actually says the opposite about this, but in my experience, that's definitely not true. Location-based adventures by far 
require more preparation than event-based adventures. Now, before we jump into the 10 steps for making an event-based adventure, I wanna remind you that you can find tons of absolutely free Dungeon Master resources on my site, thedmlayer.com. In addition to entire D&D adventures, there are magic items, NPCs, adventure ideas, and every week we add a new DM resource. As always, link below to thedmlayer.com. Go check it out for some free DM resources you can use in your games. Okay, and now 10 steps for making an event-based adventure in Dungeons and Dragons. Step one, create the villain. Having a good solid villain is extremely important, even more so than with a location-based adventure, in my opinion. Without a well-designed villain, you're really going to struggle to run an event-based adventure. And when you're developing a villain, you wanna do the same things that you would normally do when developing a villain. You wanna focus on, obviously you wanna know who the villain is and maybe have a stat block, have a description and that sort of stuff as well. But you also need to focus on what the villain's motivation is, what the villain's, like why he wants to do what he wants to do and the goal, which is what he wants to do, what he wants to accomplish and who the villain's minions are, who's he got working for him, who are the little grunts that are gonna go do his dirty work for him. So flesh those things out, have those things well determined and defined right from the get-go. Now, the motivation goal of minions are important, super important here because you're going to be using them constantly as you improvise on the fly while running the adventure. Okay, let's do an example here. Let's say you got a vampire called Sardak the Sinister, and this vampire has some minions. Of course, they're gonna have some vampire spawn and some humanoid followers that might regard them as some sort of like deity or something, and they're willing to lay down their lives in service to Sardak. And then Sardak the Sinister's motivation and goal is that he wants to incriminate a goodly vampire in the region, Petrova the Pure, who has been his foe for centuries, and of course he wants to bring about her downfall. And so now that you know what Sardak the Sinister's goal is, what his motivation is, you're going to be able to roleplay him better and have him react to what the characters do during the game. And since you know that he has vampire spawn and humanoid followers, cultists and stuff like that, at his beck and call, you can use those and deploy those against your player's characters when they go do X, Y, and Z. So having that stuff established at the get-go helps you to role play and react to what your players decide to do. Now, as far as the description of the villain goes, in this case, we have Sardak the Sinister, we could just use the vampire stat block that already exists. And you don't always have to use an existing stat block. You might create, I mean, this is your villain, this is your big bad guy, at least of the adventure. So you can definitely go ahead and create a custom stat block if you'd like. But you're going to need a stat block for him because presumably at some point he's probably going to get into a little bit of a tussle with the player's characters. So yeah, we're going we're to take the vampire stat block for Sardak the Sinister, but we're going to customize him just a little bit and give him some spell casting abilities. Step two, create the storyline or plot. Now this is basically the villain's plans for achieving their goal. The, the plans as they stand now, what they're planning on doing before the player's characters start to interfere with those plans. And of course, at that point, you're going to have to make decisions and react to what they're doing. But you're not writing out how things are gonna go. You're not literally writing a book, okay? You're just getting things set up. You're setting the scene, you're setting the situation. And how things will unfold in actuality will be determined by what happens during your game sessions. Okay, so for our example, let Sardak the Sinister is, let's say, planning a crime spree where he kills several victims in the city, draining them of blood, and then planning subtle evidence at each crime scene that points to Petra of the Pure as being the culprit. And we really should, as part of an event-based adventure, consider a timer element to the adventure that pressures the PCs, some gentle pressure, to keep them moving and not take a long rest after every event or encounter. You see, fifth edition game design is built around the adventuring day, whereby the party becomes depleted of resources over the course of the adventure and is not at full resources when they finally take on the villain. And in your typical location-based adventure with a dungeon or a castle, you have a mechanism in place that slowly depletes them of resources until they get to the villain at the end. But event-based adventures are a little bit different of an animal in that not everything is confined to that dungeon, and so there might be traveling, going here and doing that sort of thing, which gives them more of an opportunity, perhaps, to rest, short rest, or long rest, perhaps, over the course of the adventure. Which brings me back to my point of considering some sort of timer element that 
puts a restriction on them that they can't constantly take short or long rests during your event-based adventure. Okay, so in our example, we're gonna say that Sardak the Sinister kills a new victim every hour, putting pressure on the PCs to solve the problem quickly. Number three, determine the inciting action and party's goals. Basically for an inciting action, you want to flesh out how the adventure will be introduced to the characters. You want to clearly present the problem, a reward for them, and the next step to get started on the adventure. So let's say that Petra the Pure has been keeping an eye on Sardak the Sinister for centuries and suspects he is behind the murders. However, she can't risk being seen investigating the crime scenes or risk of implicating herself. So she or one of her followers approaches the PCs with a request for help, promising them gold or treasure if they find out who is behind the murders find evidence that points to them and thus bring them to justice. And she then tells them of a particular crime scene where they can begin their investigations. And just to emphasize this point here, the party's goal is usually and should be built into the inciting action, such as in the example above. They need to have a clear goal, Otherwise, they're just not gonna have any idea what they're supposed to do. Step four, determine and flesh out key NPCs. All right, so you're gonna need names, descriptions, motivations, and secrets are cool too for any key NPCs the characters might encounter while they're going about the adventure. In fact, not just might encounter, but you should develop some really cool NPCs they can come across during the adventure. And when you do so, you should answer questions such as, do the NPCs help them or hinder them? And how do they fit into the adventure? What is their role and purpose in even being included in the adventure you're designing? For example, let's say we have a retired old adventurer, Trimble, who is always sticking his nose into the affairs of the police, and he's been poking around the crime scenes too. The characters even observe him a couple times as they look at crime scenes. And there may or may not be any interactions. You don't even have to plan any interactions. Your players might decide to engage with Trimble or not engage with Trimble, and that's fine. But you got him there just in case. It's another little element of the adventure that your players might decide to do something with, and they might decide to ignore. Step five, plan events that will occur in the adventure. Now, we're not talking about planning out every little thing that's gonna happen. We're, we'll, let's, we'll get into the details here. The first thing that you wanna plan out are the events that would occur and when they would occur if the characters do nothing. For instance, in our example, you plan out several victims that Sardak the Sinister will murder and the evidence he'll leave at the crime scenes that will point to Petra the Pure. Also plan out evidence at the crime scenes that point to Sardak the Sinister. Maybe less subtle because he's not trying to leave evidence that points to him because the PCs will need to have a way to follow a trail to him and ultimately discover the truth of who's actually behind the murders. And we might plan out too to have at one point our NPC Trimble approach the characters after having noticed that they are investigating the murders. He presents them with some evidence that they missed that points to Sardak the Sinister. But we might only do that that if we absolutely need to, if the characters, the players seem like they're doing, my chair is squeaking again, if they seem like they're doing a really good job investigating things, then maybe Trimble doesn't become involved at all. And the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna plan out the villain's possible reactions to actions the PCs are likely to take. So we're gonna brainstorm things that we think our players might do in response to what's going on, and then have some reactions of Sardak the Sinister planned out in advance. This is gonna take a little bit of the burden of improvisation off from us as we run the adventure. But a big, huge word of caution here, please, for the love of all that is holy, avoid planning out a flowchart of every single possibility. I mean, maybe you wanna do it, maybe, okay, but you're, you're introducing a whole world of pain and suffering and preparation on yourself, and it may be for nothing. If you gotta do it, okay, but my recommendation is just to role play your character and react on the fly to what your players are going to do. Less work. This reminds me of this one time there was a guy, he was, he was explaining to me how he runs D&D Adventures and he literally was like, yeah, I have this massive flow chart planned so that regard, you know, any, any action at all my players take, I can figure out what's gonna happen in the game world and have all these reactions and stuff. And I'm just like, dude, that's crazy. Why don't you just let them take an action and then you in the moment decide how things are gonna behave in response. like. Isn't that easier? Like, why do you need a crazy complicated flowchart of all possibilities? But hey, you know, maybe I'm just crazy. I think we've established that I probably am. <laughs>
Okay, back to the topic at hand, reactions the villain might take. Example here, Sardak the Sinister is keeping an eye on the crime scenes to make sure the authorities are taking the bait. But when he notices the characters finding evidence that leads to him, he sends some of his humanoid followers to mislead them. That's an example of a reaction that you might plan out in advance that Sardak will take when the characters start to find evidence that leads toward him. And if that doesn't work, or when the PCs get back on the trail that points to Sardak, he dispatches some vampire spawn to simply take the characters out. First we mislead them, that didn't work, now let's just murder them too. And another reaction he might take, as the characters get closer to discovering that the true murderer is Sardak, the vampire plants more and more obvious evidence that points to Petra the Pure. And he also gets better at cleaning up evidence that points to him. Sardak might also bribe a city official who tries to interfere with the character's investigations. A and a tip related to the whole flowchart thing, don't go overboard with planning out events or villains' reactions. You can't plan out every possible contingency despite what the dude with the flowchart thought. Um, and if you try, it's a lot of work and much of it probably much of it will not get used. Not, there's no probably, much of it will not get used. So if you gotta have a flow chart or something simple, keep it simple, keep it simple, right? Um, depending on your level of experience. But the, but the more you track toward improvising things, the less preparation work you'll need to do before the game. I just, I just in one moment bashed the flow chart idea and then I gave you a concession to maybe use it. <sighs> it's conflicting advice. You should unsubscribe and just watch somebody else's channel. Step six. Plan encounters. So using the minions of the villain that you have predetermined in advance, you craft some level appropriate encounters that you could use against the characters. These might be used as part of the planned events or the villain's reactions to the character's actions in the adventure. And the idea here is that you would have a handful of encounters already pre-made and designed so that you could just grab them and throw them in the game as you need them. It's, it's kind of a pain in the butt to design encounters on the fly and make them super awesome, memorable, use terrain and lots of other cool elements that you want to include in your encounters. All that stuff is better done in advance and quite honestly, for me personally, designing encounters, that's the fun part of the game. I really want to put some effort and thought into that, make that really, really cool for my players. I'm assuming we're talking about combat encounters here. Obviously, there are other types of encounters in the game that I encourage you to use as well. Combat encounters with more preparation ahead of time usually are more satisfying. The, the humanoid followers and the vampire spawn that Sardak the Sinister sends against the characters are examples of encounters that you'll plan for the adventure, and you'll plan them in advance. You're, you're gonna be improvising a lot of things during an event-based adventure, not having to improvise all of the encounters is going to help you. And then when you're running the adventure, you just pick and choose from the encounters you planned out, using them as needed on the fly, depending on what is needed based on character actions and what the villain decides to do in response. For instance, when the characters find evidence that points to Sardak the Sinister's lair, he sends a mob of zombies to intercept them, and an incorporeal wraith flies along with them, attempting to steal away the evidence gathered thus far. And as I mentioned before, event-based adventures are much harder to follow the adventuring day mechanic with. That's detailed on Dungeon Master Guide page 84, if you're interested, and you should be because it's a very important mechanic to be aware of and use. So, since it's possible or even likely that PCs will be at full resources when they have encounters, you wanna do things like plan encounters with waves or just simply have harder deadly encounters that are gonna challenge them out of the gate because they're going to be at full resources. Like, you know, spells and hit points and all that good stuff. And like I mentioned, if you can have a timer element to discourage long resting in the adventure, you can avoid doing this sort of thing and then you could just use the adventuring day mechanic and be happy. And you can just plan out the proper number of encounters to have in your adventure, including the final boss fight, to satisfy the adventuring day mechanics. I swear one day I'm just gonna do a video on adventuring day mechanics because I mention them all the time. And then I could just tell you to go watch that video. It's that clever. I should be more clever, I would have done that already. And in our example, I think I already mentioned this, Arctic the Sinister is murdering a new victim every hour, which discourages the party from short resting, although they will probably need to a couple times, and it especially discourages them from long resting. In fact, a long rest might even lead to the city authorities following the evidence to Petra the Pure 
and arresting her. Then the pressure is on even more for the characters to clear her name and find the real murderer. Because you know, they're gonna have the execution at the next dawn or something, I don't know. Step seven, flesh out key locations. Detail out the important locations you either know or think might get used in the adventure. Uh, it doesn't need to be as detailed as a location-based adventure that typically fleshes out the details of every single room in a dungeon or castle. Y you might just need to flesh out one room in a dungeon where you know an encounter or a special part of the adventure is going to take place. For instance, one of Sardak the Sinister's victims was found in the sewers, another in a well-appointed bedroom in a manor. Well, those are the locations you need to flesh out and add details to. Don't flesh out the entire sewer system or the entire manor. Just the rooms, the parts that you know are going to be included in the adventure. So if you know an event will take place in a location, detail it out. Then you might also have a few extra locations ready that might get used as part of the villain's reactions or just in case you need them. Step eight, plan a climax. The climax of an adventure typically includes a confrontation of sorts with the villain. It's the big final event that happens wherein the characters have the chance to bring the adventure either to a successful or unsuccessful conclusion. In our example, very dramatic. <laughs> After overcoming the minions and foils that Sardak the Sinister has sent their way, the characters finally track Sardak down to his chateau on the slopes of the nearby Cloud Mountains. And Sardak cordially invites the characters into his audience hall, where he and several of his minions await. Sardak intends to bribe the characters off with wealth and veiled threats, but if that fails, the fight is on and the characters will have to defeat him in battle. For the climax, you really want to flesh out the location and the encounter, make it really tight and really cool. You can see my boss fight creation videos for tips on how to do that. Link up here, down below, it's somewhere. Step nine, plan a resolution. What happens once the characters successfully complete the adventure or fail? <laughs> Try again or go home and cry. For instance, after Sardak the Sinister is defeated and brought to justice or just plain murdered by the characters, Petrova the Pure presents the characters with their promised reward. Or if the characters fail, does Sardak continue on his murder spree or relent having accomplished his goal? Step 10, run the adventure. Captain Obvious moment here, I suppose. Play out the events according to the timeline you establish and then use the villain's counters and responses to the character's actions that you planned out. And of course, improvise along the way. And when you improvise and determine how the villain reacts to character's actions, you're going to use the villain's motivation and goal to determine exactly what they do. Don't be afraid to improvise as you go. I've been talking about improvising the whole video, so yeah, you can't be afraid to improvise or this probably isn't gonna work too well for you. Probably make an argument that if you're afraid to improvise and never want to improvise anything, that being a dungeon master is probably gonna be a very difficult path for you to follow too. In an event-based adventure, more so than a location-based adventure, you'll probably need to improvise quite a bit. I've mentioned this before, I'm reminding you now. So anyway, this is why we prepared encounters and, in, and locations in advance so use them. If you're looking for a monthly PDF stuffed with dungeon master resources such as adventure ideas, encounters with maps for virtual tabletop play, and even entire D&D adventures, don't forget to check out my Patreon. The monthly PDF is just one of the many benefits my patrons receive. Now, if you suffered through the video this far, why don't you give me a thumbs up and leave a comment for the algorithm. Let YouTube know that you're willing to suffer just a little bit more. Next week, I'll be talking about the different types of problem dungeon masters and how to avoid those pitfalls. But until then, click right here to learn how to create a location-based D&D adventure. And until next time, let's play D&D.